Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us again for another rendition of the BH virtual event space. I am joined today by none other than the great Tony Gale, who's here to talk about getting started with travel photography, something we can all relate to, even in your backyard. I'd like to thank our sponsors before going forward, the Vitech Imaging Solutions Group. Uh, Tony is definitely going to do a great job here, and I know he's got a lot to present and is very, very used to this. So I don't want to take any more of your time, Tony. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I am a Manfredo ambassador, which is why it says Manfredo here. Manfredo is part of Vitech. And today I'm going to be going over getting started with travel photography, even in your backyard. So thank you to the BH event space, as always. And thank you to Manfredo, Joby, Lastalite, Lopro, and Syrup, which are all Vitech brands. Vitech is a company that owns a bunch of really, really, really cool companies. This is just some of them. If you can think of something cool in photography that's not a camera, they probably have a piece of it. In addition to being a Manfredo ambassador and getting to work with all these fun brands, I'm also a Sony artist of imagery and x right Colorado and the APA national president, just so that you know if any of those come up and no one can say, you didn't say. I'm primarily a commercial photographer. I shoot people in portraits. This is me when I just got started in Seattle when I was still cooking. That's me taking a bunch of pictures of myself last summer because I wasn't allowed to take pictures of anybody else. And now I'm gonna talk about travel photography. So this was on a trip out west a couple of years ago. Travel photography is super fun. We all wanna travel. It's an amazing time to be a photographer. When I first started traveling, this was from my first trip to Europe. I went to Paris. Everything was film. Everything was slow. Everything was expensive. I'd take a bunch of pictures. I'd process the film. I would hope that I got something cool. If I did, fantastic. And there is something to be said for picking up the film and seeing a picture for the first time and being like, wow, I took that. But it's also really expensive. I brought 70 rolls of film with me on my first trip to Italy. It's a lot of film. It cost me a lot to process it. Now with, with digital and what we have available to us, we can take a lot more pictures. We can take a lot more chances. We can really do amazing things. And the tools we have, the accessories we have. When, we, when I started out, the average camera bag that everybody had was this canvas shoulder bag with no padding. Everybody had it. If you dropped it, whatever was in it broke. If something banged against it, it broke. It wasn't comfortable, but that was the bag everybody had or a steel case. Now what we have available, tripods, bags, everything, it's really amazing. So travel photography, pictures of places, right? It's a little tricky to travel right now, as we all know. So we're going to be talking about travel photography no matter where you are. Every place that I've just shown you, Wyoming, Wyoming again, you know, back here, Iceland, Niagara Falls. Somebody lives in all those places. You might be the person that lives there. Wherever you live is a place that other people travel to. There are travel photographs you can make there, no matter where you are. And we'll talk about finding places and thinking about it in a little bit. But everywhere is travel to someone. It's easy to get sort of stuck with wherever you live and think, well, there's nothing to photograph here because I live here. I live in New York and I sometimes get that way. And in a normal year, millions of people come to New York because it's an amazing city. Think about that. And think about, we talked about cameras. We talked about how great everything is. How are you going to bring that gear around? I mentioned that canvas bag that everybody had at the beginning. It was a shoulder bag. There's different kinds of camera bags to think about. I have, I'm going to guess about 12 camera bags, and I use each of them for different purposes. I did a through hike in the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago. That was a specific bag. There's different bags. There's shoulder bags, single strap hanging over your shoulder. The advantage of that is it's really easy to get into the bag. The disadvantage is sometimes it can weigh down on one shoulder or the other more. There's roller bags. Normally, if I'm going on a commercial shoot or if I'm traveling via plane, I'll bring a roller bag, put it in the overhead. You can put a ton of stuff in it, but it's not as heavy or it's not as light as something like a backpack. 
Backpacks are my favorite bag if I'm walking around. I'd much rather have a backpack than a shoulder bag. Everybody's different. And we'll, I'll show you an example of one of the ones I'm using right now in a minute. And then, of course, you want to think about the size of your bag. So you want a shoulder bag, a roller bag, a backpack, all three. And how big do you want it to be? You want it to be big enough that you can carry everything you need, but you don't want it so big that you're not that you've got a ton of room and things are rattling around and it's too bulky to carry. There are, for example, roller bags that are too big to carry onto a plane. Maybe you're never going to fly, so it doesn't matter. But maybe you are going to fly uh, as soon as you're allowed to. And then you don't want a bag that you have to check. So right now, the Low Pro Fast Pack BP 250 AW3, I know it's a mouthful, is a bag that I've been using a lot. Partly why I love this bag is because, as you can see on the bottom, I can put a bunch of stuff. I have a, my A7R3 there with a 100 to 400, three other lenses and a flash. I can put a tripod uh, in the tripod holder on the outside. I can fit a laptop. I can fit a notebook. I can fit a book to read while I'm waiting. I can fit snacks, a bottle of water, lots of stuff. This kind of bag where it's got the compartment on the bottom for cameras and then a compartment on the top for other things is really great if you're doing day hikes, if you're wandering around your neighborhood, maybe there's a park nearby, a state park or a national park, or you just want to wander around. It's nice to have something where you can carry things besides cameras, which is why I like this. All right, now that you're carrying your stuff, you got to think about what kind of photo you're going to make. Travel photography is photographs of where you are, right? Where, where you're visiting, where you live, whatever it is. It could be food, it could be landscapes, it could be about the people, it could be any number of things. Most of my travel photography is landscapes because that's what I respond to. But it's the story of where you are. One of the first things you want to think about is what is in the photo, not just what the subject is. So for example, this is a picture of a, of a rose bush. Is it a good picture of a rose bush? No, it's a terrible picture of a rose bush because while the rose bush is right there in the middle and we know it's a picture of that, there's a lot of distracting things. It's really easy for all of us, especially when we're starting out and even sometimes when we're experienced, to only think about what it is that we want to photograph and not all the extraneous stuff around. So think about what is in your frame and try different angles. So this is the same bush, closer, different from the left, from the right, tighter, backlit, frontlit, getting really tight with a bunch of different angles. Always try multiple things, and we'll mention that again. And then I ended up with that. So this is a picture of a rose. It's clear that it's a picture of a rose. The blue in the background, I think, accentuates it. It doesn't have a bunch of distracting things around it. This is thinking about what your subject is and thinking about the environment and simplifying. There's a lot of times where that picture is amazing, but there's a bunch of stuff in the way. Try a different angle and think about what's in that frame or crop later. You could use foreground elements to hide things. This is a picture I took in Rome of the Pantheon a few years ago. The reason that this, I put the fountain in the front here is if you look to the right, you can see there's a couple people there. And you can see that blue vertical streak. That's from somebody selling one of those little helicoptery things that goes up. The fountain is here to hide the fact that there's like 50 people in front of this. I don't want to show 50 people in front of this. I think that's a less interesting picture. I think it's more interesting just to see the ancient structure and the ancient architecture. So if you look for something so that you can hide whatever it is you don't like, put a tree in front of it, put a fountain in front of it. Changing your angle just a little bit makes things better. So if, let's say you're literally in your backyard and you want to photograph that bird on the tree and there's a swing set in the way, it moves so that either the swing set's gone or that you can maybe hide the swing set with another tree. There's always tricks and things you can do to adjust so that what you want is focused on and any distracting elements are removed. You could try different focal lengths. So this is a few years ago out in Utah. This is an Arches National Park. This is trying a bunch of different focal lengths. Now with this, I like almost all of them. 
I think the different focal lengths work. But you can see, then this is just going from 100 to 400. You can see that there's a lot of differences. There's a dramatic difference if it's tighter or further back or in the middle. Try different focal lengths, see what works. It's also just as it's easy to come in and just point your camera at whatever you like and not think about it. It's also easy to just stick with whatever your lens is zoomed to or whatever lens you have on your camera. Try mixing it up. So 100, 400, it makes a difference. Same thing here, 30 millimeters on the left, 280 millimeters on the right. The shot on the left is okay. I mean, it, it tells a story, but the one on the right is a lot more interesting. And this is, we'll talk about uh, stability in a, in a minute as well, the importance of keeping your camera stable. This is an example of why keeping your camera sturdy and stable is important. If you want to take a picture like this, and get that silky thing, you, you're gonna need a tripod. We'll talk about that more, but stability is important. So more examples, 34 millimeters, 77 millimeters, 105 millimeters, you get different compression. Obviously I've moved as well. Think about your camera height. This is out in Yellowstone. Picture's fine, it's interesting to see all the steam, but then get lower and point down. This is a lot more interesting of a picture. This has color, it's more dramatic, it's more fun. This is, yeah, I was at Yellowstone, there was some steam, cool. This is a picture that I like to look at. I think this is a lot more interesting. Think about what direction you're pointing the camera and getting low, getting high. We all have a tendency when we're taking pictures, or most of us at least, to photograph from whatever height we are. I'm 5'9", so my tendency is to shoot from 5'9". If you're six foot, you shoot from six foot. If you're five foot, you shoot from five foot. Think about getting higher, getting lower, lift your camera up, get really low, try different things. Point straight up, point through things. Try those multiple angles and positions. This is out in uh, Sequoia National Park a couple years ago. You see just that little difference tilting things. It makes a big difference. So the one on the left is fine. The one on the right, and obviously I recognize photography is subjective. There's someone who's gonna like the one on the left better. I like the one on the right better. The one on the right is more dynamic because of the angle of the trees. And that's just rotating the camera on the tripod. Trying different angles again. I know it feels like this is being repeated a lot, it's being repeated a lot because I think it's important. When I do in-person workshops and events, I will often tell people, anything you're photographing, photograph it three different ways. So you see this old house in Iceland, come in, photograph it from whatever angle drew your attention, but walk around, try different things. Almost never is the best angle, the angle that you saw at the beginning. Sometimes it is, but it's, you're probably shooting digital. There's no harm in taking more pictures. You're gonna benefit from it and you're gonna get stronger pictures. And that's the one I like the best. Same thing, try different angles. All right, now camera support. Camera support, tripods usually. It's important. I know that sometimes people don't want to carry a tripod. I've talked to people who don't wanna carry a tripod. There's solutions to that. And the number of times that you will wish you had a tripod that you didn't bring with you is much higher than the regret of bringing a tripod with you, especially if you bring the right one. I also have a bunch of tripods. There's two behind me right now. They all function for different things and serve different purposes. Just like bags, maybe one bag is the answer for you. Maybe one tripod is the answer for you. Maybe three is, it, you know, it's gonna depend on who you are, what kinds of photographs you wanna make, what kind of budget you have. But think about that. So if you wanna do a photograph like this, this was out in LA, maybe you wanna photograph the traffic going by in front of your house. Maybe you want the stars streaking in your backyard if you're lucky enough to live somewhere where it's dark enough. You could, I suppose, try and set this on a railing and hope that nothing jostles it or you could put your camera on the ground and point it straight up and hope that works. But a tripod is gonna solve a lot more problems for you. It's adjustable, 
you can shoot a long exposure. This was, I think, 10 or 15 seconds. No matter how good the image stabilization is, your, is in your camera, you can't hold it for 15 seconds. It's just not possible. Or let me rephrase that. You can hold it for 15 seconds. It won't be sharp. And this picture doesn't work if it's not sharp. Something like this with stars. You need something stable. And whether, even if you don't want to do long exposures, there is a trick, assuming you have Photoshop. If you don't have Photoshop, it's worth considering. This is in Prospect Park. It's about three blocks from my apartment in Brooklyn. I don't like landscape pictures with a bunch of people in them. It's just, it's just distracting to me, right? This, none of these pictures are that interesting. But with a tripod, you can shoot a bunch of pictures, select them all in Photoshop. This is in Bridge, just to show you how many there are. Go to Photoshop, go to File, Scripts, Statistics, select Median. I know this is a lot of steps. Don't worry, this is being recorded. You'll be able to look at it later. Select all the pictures. Uh, I would hit Attempt to automatically align source images just in case there was a little breeze or something jostled your camera a little. Hit OK. And it will combine all the pictures and remove things that aren't in all the frames. So you can still see there's a couple of people sitting on the grass over there, and there's a little bit of blur uh, from people there in the middle. But it now looks empty because I combined 30 pictures that were photographed on the tripod so the camera didn't move, and that's what's key. 30 pictures combined that way, does it automatically, it's a piece of cake, and all of a sudden you can get a picture that doesn't have a bunch of distracting people in it assuming they're moving. If it's something like in front of the Pantheon where everybody's just sitting, you'd have to camp out for a long time to get enough shots where everybody had moved. But something like that where people are running and biking and walking, sit there for 30 seconds, take 30 pictures, combine them. It's really cool. It's a really easy trick to do. And for me, it makes things a lot more interesting. But you need a tripod. I also use a remote so that I really don't jostle anything. Because when you're using camera support, every time you hit the camera, it's possible for things to get adjusted. When you're thinking about camera support, when you're thinking about a tripod or a monopod, some of the things you want to think about, stability, to me, that's probably the most important thing. My parents, when I was young and just getting into photography, were nice enough to go to the mall and talk to a salesperson who sold them a tripod for $60 that they were very excited to give me for Christmas that wiggled. Like it was very nice of them, but it, it wiggled. It was not a stable tripod. You want something that's stable. There are things, you know, there's a spectrum of stability. So I have behind me this great big tripod. It's a big tripod. It's very stable because it's big. And so you have to balance how big and stable you want it with the size. But if it's not stable at all, it's not worth getting. The $40 tripod, if it's full size, is not worth getting. There are things, we'll talk about it in a minute, like the Gorilla Pod or the Pixie that are tiny. And I actually love both of those. But for a full size tripod, if it's not stable, it's not worth getting. If it's $50, it's probably not worth getting. Then you've got the size of the tripod. Do you want a tripod that's big. So I have a get so giant that will go to, I think, 11 feet. That's fantastic, but it's too big for me to use for everything. For the things I need it for, it's great. For other things, it's not. You want something that you'll use. If you're always in a studio, you're always photographing from your house. If you're taking travel in your backyard, literally, so you're photographing from your porch, you can go with a bigger, heavier tripod. The size matters less as long as it's big enough. Weight, this is also very important. You have carbon fiber and aluminum. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Carbon fiber is lighter. It absorbs vibration better. It's more expensive. Aluminum is cheaper. It's a little heavier, which can make it more stable depending on the circumstances because its weight itself makes it more stable. But if it's too heavy for you to carry, then what's the point of having it? If you're going to leave it in the car because you don't want to go hiking with this tripod, it's probably not the right tripod for you. And then, of course, there's cost. 
the budget everybody is going to have is different. You can spend as much money as you want at the high end. At the low end, you've got to be careful. Again, if it's $50, it's probably not, not the right tripod for you. Just taking a picture out of Prospect Park. Using the Manfrotto Element M2 Mobile Bluetooth Carbon Fiber Traveler Tripod. I know that's a mouthful. So the Traveler line is a line of portable tripods. The legs flip up, so it packs up very small. The Element M2 Mobile Bluetooth <coughs> excuse me, has a Bluetooth remote so that you can trigger your phone remotely if you wanted to do a selfie or take pictures of things. If, for example, you're photographing with your phone, totally fine. If you're photographing the camera, totally fine. With this, if you want to put a phone on there, you can trigger it remotely. Everything we're talking about can be done with an interchangeable lens camera. It can be done with a phone. I've got my Xperia phone right here. I'm using a big camera, an A7R three, to point it at me right now. The, it's just a tool. And the tool you have is the tool that you're going to use. Lots of people start with phone photography. I use my phone sometimes. Nothing wrong with it. The Element M2 also comes with a little phone adapter so that you can uh, mount your phone right to it. You can use the remote. And it comes in aluminum. So we talked about price and aluminum versus carbon fiber. As of a couple of days ago, this was the price. Pricing changes all the time. I don't know if it's current or not. Don't take any of these screenshots as meaning anything except that's what it cost on the day I did the screenshot, which was last Wednesday, I think. It's carbon fiber. It's a great tripod. It's light. The aluminum one is about $70 cheaper. What's the right one for you? I don't know. I prefer carbon fiber. Almost all my tripods are carbon fiber because I prefer the weight and the vibration uh, reduction. But everybody's different. The aluminum one also comes in two colors. You can get it in black or red. Now, when you're looking at tripods and trying to decide what to buy, we talked about size. You're going to want to look at the load capacity. So the load capacity of this, which is a very light tripod, you saw it uh, next to my bag on that photo of the low pro bag. It can handle 17 pounds. That's a lot of camera. A lot of lighter tripods can't carry that much weight. So you have to think about how heavy is your camera? How heavy is your lens? If you're putting a phone on it, the capacity could be a pound and you'd be fine. I mean, the tripod itself might be too wiggly. But if you're putting you know, a big camera at a 200 to 600, it's a lot more weight. You want to make sure that the load capacity is high. Always look at that. You want to look at the maximum height. That's how high you can raise the tripod, including the center column. So 63 inches, it's about five feet, three inches. So, you know, almost eye height, pretty high for a really compact portable camera. It has the universal smartphone clamp, a Bluetooth remote. And then there's the minimum height of just under 17 inches. So pretty small, again, It'll hold 17 pounds, that's great. And it'll pack up to 17 inches long, which means that you're more likely to bring it with you. That's why we're focusing on this one. It's not heavy to carry. You can strap it to your backpack and put it in your bag. So the tripod that you're gonna use is the right tripod. If you buy one that goes, you know, the Giant, for example, and then you don't wanna carry it, it's the wrong tripod. There's the smartphone clamp. So the smartphone clamp, super easy to use. It'll work with almost anything. It can be vertical or horizontal. And then again, the Bluetooth remote, you just pair it with your phone and you can use it to trigger, uh, you can use it to trigger your phone and take pictures. So if you want to set up the camera and back off so the animals come close, you can do that. If you wanna use it to take self portraits, you can do that. It's really a cool little feature. Then there's things like the Joby Gorilla Pod. So this is the 3000 kit. I often bring a full-size tripod and a Gorilla Pod with me when I travel. Again, even if it's local, even if I'm driving to a big park or state park or a national park, if there's one nearby, because the Gorilla Pod can be attached to almost anything. 
there's they come in different sizes. The kits have the ball head, which is what I want. I always want the ball head. But you can strap it to anything. So if you're in a situation where there's the ground's uneven or you can't, maybe you can't put a tripod down, you can use the gorilla pod to wrap around things and get stability and still take a picture. <clears throat> in New York, there's places where you may not want to use a tripod or you may not be allowed to use a tripod. And I'm not saying you should do this, but I had never been hassled for attaching something to something vertical so it's not in the way. Usually if they say no tripods, not always, it's a safety thing, right? They don't want people tripping over the tripod legs that you set up. If you have it on something vertical and out of the way, they still may tell you no, fine. Um, but it's not a safety issue anymore. It's not something that somebody is going to trip over. And I don't want to be responsible for somebody tripping. I have liability insurance. I don't ever want to use it. So the Gorilla Pods are really fantastic for that. And they're tiny. And then, of course, we've got the Pixie. The Pixie is an itty bitty little tripod. It'll hold the cell phone. It's 25 bucks. I almost always have one of these just in whatever bag I'm carrying. I can put my phone on it. I can put my point and shoot RX100 on it. It will even hold a full size camera if you balance it right. It's just nice to always have there. And for 25 bucks, it's shockingly good. It's shockingly portable. It's tiny. It's a great little camera. And then if you're going to use your phone, you're going to need a clamp to hold the phone. So if you bought the M2 that we talked about, the Bluetooth, you're set. That comes with a phone clamp. If you're going to use something else, this is what I use. It's the Joby Griptite Pro Smartphone Mount. 27 bucks. It rotates. It'll take just about any phone. You, so you can do vertical. You can do horizontal. You can put it on the Gorilla Pod. You can put it on a full size tripod if you want. You can put it on the Pixie. It solves a lot of problems. All right. I'm going quick. I know. Uh, so another thing, how many of you have taken a picture and it's either hazy or there's just weird stuff? If you want to take a picture like this, the lens has to be completely clean. Different than the sensor, which should also be clean, but sensor dust is actually easier to clean for me than the weirdness that you get if you take a picture of like this into the sun and there's stuff on your lens. Similar to this, this, all pictures I really like taking. I really like shooting into the sun. I like getting those sun stars. But if you don't keep it clean, like the lens pen here, always in my bag, super easy to use, you end up with this. So this is fine, but you can see there's just the weirdness around it, right? There's the little line on the sort of lower left. There's these little specks of brightness. That's because there's dust on the lens and that flare is hitting that dust and it's causing weird things. And that's really hard, at least for me, to clean up and post. It can be done, but it's, it's a challenge. If I had just made sure my lens was clean before I took this picture, it's not an issue. If you like those dramatic into the sun, into the light itself pictures, you got to keep it clean. Whether it's a camera, whether it's your phone, keep it clean. Using something that's designed for that is a good choice. There are fabrics and other things like maybe you just you're wearing a t-shirt, so you use your t-shirt, but maybe your t-shirt's dirty. Maybe you were sweating that day and there's some salt on it. You don't want that kind of thing touching your lenses. So it's better to have something that's dedicated to that. So I like the lens pen. And then of course, you're out there photographing taking a bunch of pictures, shoot all day, go through a couple of batteries, you come home at night, you want to take pictures in the next day, you've got a battery charger, but it only charges one battery at a time. Think about this. So the Pro Cube, another accessory I really like, charges two batteries at a time, and it will tell me what the charge is. So you can see here, it said 56 and 80% with this example. That way you know, well, you know, I need to go out, but both my batteries are 85% fine, or they're both at 20%, that's going to be a problem. It's good to know exactly where you're at and being able to charge two at once. With two batteries, I can go all day. 
So if every night I charge the batteries, go out the next morning, I'm set. It's really nice to have that option to charge two at once. And then you're out there, you're taking travel pictures. You know that you want to be out there first light, last light, because that's when the light is best. But you overslept because you were watching too many movies last night or whatever. You're in a situation where it's the middle of the day, it's sunny. You want to be able to control the light a bit. So two of my favorite things for that, the last light tri-flip eight and one, and the last light halo. So the halo folds up to about this big. The last light uh, tri-flip folds up to about this big and has different covers. <clears throat> but the halo always fits in my bag because it's tiny. And it comes with either a silver and white, as you can see on the left, or a translucent, I think it's two stop on the right. And what that does in a situation like this, this is on the roof of my condo in Brooklyn. It's a bright sunny day, everything's kind of contrasty, direct sunlight on the, on the leaf there. Now, the light is much softer on that. It's just holding the halo up. The sun goes through it, it diffuses, it gets softer. It becomes more flattering if you want to photograph plants or flowers or insects. Having that in your bag lets you photograph all day long instead of being noon and the light looks terrible because it's too harsh. Pull out the halo, pull out the tri-flip, either do some diffusion, reflect some light in. This is a lot, this photo is a lot more interesting to me than this one. A little bit of light control goes a long way. All right, now. Then the question is, where do you photograph? You live somewhere, we talked about it. You've been there for 20 years, it's boring. What's new and exciting? There are interesting places everywhere. Wherever you live, there's something interesting. I've been to all 50 states. All of them have something interesting. Even if you have to drive 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, there's something interesting. And I would argue even literally in your backyard, there's something interesting. If you're not sure, if you have a macro lens, just put that macro on and get super close, get that tripod, get in really tight, you'll find something cool. <clears throat> so start where you are. Like I said, I live in New York. It's a little bit of an advantage because it's New York, center of the world. It's Manhattan skyline, <clears throat> the little red lighthouse under the Washington, uh, George Washington Bridge. When I show people who live in New York City this picture and tell them it's in New York, almost all of them ask where it is. Because all of us have things we don't know about that are cool nearby, everybody. Unless you have walked every inch of every road in your town and everything around and looked high and low and everywhere, I promise you there's something cool, always. And you just may not know about it. So Little Red Lighthouse under the George Washington Bridge, Times Square in the snow, Coney Island in the fog. This is Watkins Glen State Park. It's a couple hours, or a few hours outside New York, uh, outside Manhattan. I didn't know about this. I learned about it because New York State was doing a travel campaign on subways in New York City. And this was an example of a place that you should go if you lived in New York City that you could just drive to. It was awesome. It's super cool. I never would have known about it. And it's just a few hours outside the city. Everywhere, there's something cool. So let's talk about how to find those cool places. This, some of this may seem rudimentary, I know. But start with Google Maps. Easy enough. The first thing I always do is just look for the green spots, because they're almost always parks. Here we are in Brooklyn and into Queens. I don't know how many of you watching are in New York, but if you haven't been to Floyd Bennett Field, super cool. Most people I know haven't been. It's an old airport. For a while, they were talking about using it to supplement JFK, but it predates JFK. There's old runways that you can drive on and walk on. There's old hangars that are just falling apart. There's also like an ice rink and stuff, the Aviator Sports and Events Complex. And then we've got Fort Tilden, Gateway National Rec area, also cool. There's a lot of cool things out there. But you look at that, you see the green things, you're like, okay, that's cool. Then switch to satellite view. You can see the runways on Floyd Bennett Field. 
<clears throat> you can't see the cool stuff at Fort Tilden really unless you get really close. But how cool is it that you can walk on those runways? I think that's super cool. So I switched to satellite view. That gives me a better sense. You can see where the beaches are. You can see where the green stuff is actually green. Broad channel is super cool. Then street view. So anywhere that's blue, Google Street View has been through with cameras. And if you click on that area, like here, it brings up that view so you can see what it looks like. It's usually, you know, they were in a moving vehicle at whatever time they happen to be there. So the light is usually garbage, but you can see this is one of the runways at Fort Tilden or at uh, Floyd Bennett Field. You can actually get there and move the camera around. When they're doing it, they've got multiple cameras so that are photographing simultaneously. So you can change your angle. You can look left, right, forward, back and see exactly what it looks like. So it's a way to scout and find interesting places without spending days and days going to a place and saying, that's boring, this is boring, I don't like that spot. Try a bunch of different things. You can see this is the Marine Parkway Bridge. It gives you exactly a cool spot. You can see using the little person on the bottom, you can scroll up and down. That tells you exactly where the photo was taken. So if you find something that you think is cool, you can find exactly where that was made and go and take a better picture. Because I promise you, you're going to take a better picture than the Google Street View car. And when you find a place, even like Watkins Glen, that a million people have photographed. That bridge that I showed you, I've seen pictures of that bridge a million times. None of them look exactly like mine. I had really good, I was just lucky with the time of day and the light. But if I looked at enough, there'd probably be one that almost was identical to mine. Well, I, when I'm traveling, try and take pictures of things that I haven't seen before. There are times when I take the picture, even though I have seen it before. When I went to Machu Picchu, there's a spot in Machu Picchu where you see everything, the mountain in the background that everybody photographs from. Everybody photographs from that spot because it looks cool. And even though you may have seen that picture before, you haven't taken that picture before. So, so make the picture. And then after you've made the picture that you've seen, see if you can find something that you haven't seen. But there's no harm in taking that same picture. If it looks cool to you, take the picture. So you can look, here's Brighton Beach. You can see the little person on the, the little yellow person on the beach. You can see exactly what you're looking for. The pier at Coney Island. Beyond that, Flickr and Instagram are great tools. With Flickr, you can do a search. So I just searched for NYC. It brings up a bunch of photographs that were tagged in New York City. And you can start getting a sense of what cool things are around. If you photograph, just put in your hometown, see what comes up. There will be something cool. And maybe it's a location you want to photograph from. Maybe it's not. Or maybe it gives you an idea for something else. But Flickr is a great tool. Instagram, you can search by location as well. And sometimes when you click on them, they're more specific. This is Topeka, just to give you an example. I think Topeka is not somewhere that people really think about that much, but you can search anywhere. So that was New York City. This is Topeka. There are things in Topeka that look cool. Those, those flowers look cool. I really actually like that pancake house and that bowling alley sign, that neon on the bowling alley and the sort of retro uh, pancake house sign, those are cool. If I was there, I would want to photograph those signs. They look cool. And I wouldn't know that they were there except looking here and seeing that they exist, and then I could go try and find them. There is always, of course, the classic national parks. There are 63 national parks all over the country, but you know, two thirds of them are on the are west of the Mississippi. On the East Coast, we don't have a ton, but there are 423 national park sites. So the 63 national parks are national parks, but there are national historic parks, there are national recreation areas. There's other things that are national park administered that aren't national parks. And there's 423 of those. So if you go to nps.gov slash find a park slash index dot htm. There'll be a quiz later. 
you can search by a state and it will bring up everything that's in that state. So if you look here, each of those little dots is a national park administered site. So New York City does not have a national park, but it has a bunch of national historic parks. It has national recreation areas. It's got a lot of other things. And a lot of those things are really cool. I mean, New York City, we've got Grant's Tomb. We've got the Teddy Roosevelt birthplace. We've got uh, the FDR thing on Roosevelt Island. We've got Grant Grain, or uh, no, I already said Grant's Tomb. We've got Hamilton Grange. We've got the uh, Gateway National Rec area. There's a lot of stuff just in New York City that are super cool. We've got Federal Hall. And wherever you are, there's something relatively close. And it's, it's worth looking. It's worth exploring. To give you an example, New York City, the African burial ground. Uh, New York State has the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, which includes Connecticut, Georgia, Maine, Maryland. Uh, and he, oh, Massachusetts, Maine, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, Vermont, West Virginia. That goes through all those states. There's so many cool things. The Captain John Smith Chesapeake, also in New York, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, DC, Pennsylvania. We are fortunate to have so many amazing things. There's a, there's a reason a lot of people come and visit the United States. It's because there's so many really amazing places here. There's a lot of amazing places all over the world too. That's why I like to travel other places too. But don't forget that there are cool things around you. All right. Do we have any questions? All right. Thank you very much, Tony. First of all, uh, I want to say that uh, I, I love some of the tips that you gave over there. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Brooklyn guy myself, so I relate to a lot of the, the places that you were talking about, you know, the Floyd Bennett Field. Um, you, you showed the, 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 the image of the, uh, the, the lighthouse underneath the Washington, uh, the George Washington Bridge. I'm sorry. That was, a, that was a great moment for me when I ran the marathon this last year. And uh, that, was, that was the point where I died and I couldn't go anymore. <laughs> so it, it, brought up, it brought up good memories. So I appreciate that. <laughs> good. And it's cool, right? There's so many cool things. People just, it's easy to get sort of jaded because it's where you live or to just not realize that they're there. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. I think, I think you said it best, you know, especially in a, you know, on one hand, you said, that, you know, you, you have the advantage and I have the advantage that we live in New York city, which definitely is an advantage in, in some aspects, but it's almost sometimes a disadvantage because we take it for granted. And so you don't stop to, I'll be cliche here and say, smell the roses. Right. Uh, and so you just walk around and you, you, you don't expect anything. You're just like, I'm never going to find the next shot. I'm never going to find what I'm looking for. So it's great to, to have some of those tips that you shared with us to, to change the way we're looking at things and see things in a different light. So I definitely, for one, appreciate it. I think everybody else here did. Um, I've got some questions pouring in here. All right. Uh, so we'll start off with Sally, who wanted to know, going back to the first image from the Pantheon, what type of filter did you use on the water in the, in the front for the fountain? So I didn't use a filter. That's the advantage of using a tripod because the, um, because it was a long exposure, it was a couple of seconds that causes the water to get that milky effect without a tripod. That's not going to happen, but you, you shouldn't need a filter to get that. If you're photographing at night, if you're photographing during the day, and you want that long exposure, then a polarizer or neutral density filter is what you're going to need. But if you're photographing at night, you should be able to get a long exposure anyway, no problem. Awesome. I love it. That was like a, that was like a curveball question, trick question. <laughs> um, Elizabeth is coming to us and she's got a two-part question here. Uh, first, she would like to know, uh, what would you use an 11 foot tripod for? That's, that's the first part of that. And then uh, a, a follow-up to that would be, do you follow the rule that says shooting midday in bright sun is a no-no? So the 11 foot tripod, um, I use it when I, just to get very high. So I did a photograph at the photo expo uh, a couple of years ago from a booth because there were a whole bunch of people in front of the booth and it looked really cool. So I had an 11 foot tripod so I could get the tripod really high. I remotely triggered the camera and it allowed me to get a vantage point that wouldn't have been possible without climbing up a ladder. Um, so that's, that's the main reason, just to get that height. But I don't use it, I use it three or four times a year. And when I need it, I really, really, really need it. Uh, but I'm not gonna bring a tripod that big 
as a day-to-day -day thing. And then what was the other question? The, the second question was, do you follow the rule that says shooting midday in bright sun is a no-no? Uh, no, I don't. In part, depending on what you're photographing. So if you're photographing plants or insects or something, using that, like something like the last light halo where you can diffuse the light makes it look beautiful. And that direct sun is a great time to do that and get that nice soft look. But aside from that, it depends on what you're photographing. There are definitely things that you're going to do get that you're going to get better pictures if it's earlier or later in the day. But there are places that look great in direct sun. Like sometimes, for example, if you're say in the desert, that direct sun makes it feel like the desert. Like you, you want that harshness to really get that that feeling of the barrenness and the heat and the, all of that and the direct sun helps from that um also i don't have examples of it because no matter what i do i always think of things i could have added you know that i try not to make these decks 200 slides long um in new york city for example out in the boroughs in brooklyn and queens uh in the bronx way northern in manhattan there's elevated subways we still call them subways even though they're elevated and they're not sub those in the middle of the day when the sun is directly above, you get this really beautiful light where the sun is coming through the trestles and you get that contrast of sunlight and shadow that looks amazing. It looks amazing in the middle of the day. So there's always things that are gonna look better in that and things that are gonna look worse. So if where you're photographing under a harsh direct sun doesn't look good, look for something that does. There will be something that looks great. Awesome. I love it. I love it. You're, you're like giving me ideas. I'm writing everything down like as you go. Um, our good buddy Hayden Green joining us from Facebook. Uh, any tips for getting exceptions to restricted spaces for photographers? Um, well, ask. I mean, so there's, there's two things I would say. Uh, the first is three, maybe. We're going to make this a long, complicated answer. If it's restricted, it's restricted for a reason. Um, I feel like as someone who does talks like this, I am very scrupulous. I do not, if I'm in a national park and it says stay on the trail, I stay on the trail. I do not step off the trail. The reason those rules are there is to protect things. And, you know, one of us decides that we don't have to do it and then someone else does and then someone else does. And then pretty soon, whatever it is that's being protected is ruined. So usually those rules are there for a reason or it's private property and then they can do what they want. So find out who is responsible for making those rules and see if you can speak to them. There may be an exception. Um, if you are someone who takes a lot of pictures, maybe you can go to that person or that entity and offer them if it's a picture you really want to make. Maybe you can say, can I get access to this? in exchange for giving you five pictures that you can use for social media, for example. That's a possibility. Sometimes you can pay for permits to get that. Uh, the other option is if you have a relationship with any sort of editorial place, any, like a website that publishes or a magazine that publishes or a newspaper that publishes, sometimes you can get access by pitching that publication on a story idea. Because while Tony Gale photographer calls up Scott and says, hey, can I photograph the warehouse at B&H? Scott says, no. No, you can't. I'll, just invite, you. Me. I'll invite you in. All right, well. Come on over. <laughs> um, you know, he says, no, but if I, if let's say I pitch the New York Times on it, and the New York Times says, hey, we want to do a story on the warehouse at B&H, and then they go to you, you're probably going to say yes. It, it depends on who's doing the asking. And there are so many websites and publications out there that if you can find something that whatever, whatever place it is that you want to get access to is relevant to and approach them, that's a way. I had an idea, it's not travel related, but I wanted to photograph women mayors and I couldn't figure out how to get access. And then I realized I was an idiot and just approached a magazine I work with and pitched them. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then when the magazine reaches out, everybody says yes. So th those are my suggestions. Yeah, I think okay. I, I think those are great great suggestions. I remember I remember a few years ago I reached out to uh, Gravesend Cemetery, 
which I'm sure you're probably familiar with, Tony. Um, and I wanted to do like just a little little kind of thing out there. And they they were they weren't exactly responsive. <laughs> they were a little uh, you know disturbed by the fact that I wanted to go into the cemetery and, and and shoot some images. But like you said, I think definitely the best starting starting point is always asking first for permission. Um, especially if, if there's any chance that you can get into some serious trouble. It's usually a good rule of thumb, I think. Yeah, and it's just respectful. I mean, you don't want somebody to come into your backyard and take pictures without asking. Exactly. It could be creepy. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I will acknowledge there are places that are just, who knows why this thing is there. Clearly nobody's been there for 50 years. Then it's a different story, but. Go with your, go with your gut. Yeah. But there are, there are places in New York that I would love to get access to, and I just haven't tried yet. Uh, North Brother Island, where uh, Typhoid Mary was kept, that looks super cool. There's two islands, I don't remember what they're called, off of Staten Island that were used during World War II to store stuff, and now they're bird sanctuaries. I would love to get out there. But yeah, you need, uh, you need permission. You need permission, yeah. Uh, Jay Cooperman joining us from live stream. Do you recommend ball heads for the tripods? And if so, do you have a recommendation? So that is very subjective. I prefer ball heads um, because I like to just be able to twist one thing and move it around. There are people I know who much prefer, uh, who much prefer pan tilt heads. Um, so it just depends on you. I like ball heads. And then it depends on uh, like sometimes pan tilt heads like this is a pan tilt head here. Uh, if you're photographing, say, lands or not landscapes, if you're photographing architecture or still life, I think a pan tilt is the way to go. Um, and then in terms of a recommendation, I'm trying to remember what ones I have. The tripod I use the most is my Gitzo Traveler, and it has a Gitzo. Uh, ball head. Um, shoot. I cannot remember the name of the other. I mean, obviously, I, I have a relationship with Manfrotto, so there's that, but I have a relationship with Manfrotto because I really, really like their stuff. Um, when you're looking at a ball head, make sure that you look at the weight that the ball head could support, because while we talked about the weight that the tripod could support, the one I showed you was a tripod that came with a ball head you can get a ball head that can't support enough weight. And so if you put it on legs that can support it, but the ball head can't, that's a problem. Um, if you email me, if you want to email me, uh, I just, I'm easy to find Tony, Tony is my website. Um, I will look at the one I have, the man for the ball head I have and let you know, I just don't remember what the model number is. Awesome. To be fair, every photo company, the naming of stuff, is challenging sometimes it's hard to remember a lot of numbers yeah yeah excellent and uh josh josh and rich actually had uh questions that kind of i think uh border on each other they kind of lead into each other josh was asking what are some good outlets for a travel photography beginner looking to sell or market their photos and rich followed up with what do i do with my photos books slideshows youtube Flickr, etc um so if you're looking for outlets, as in ways to make money, it's more limited. Uh, there are stock agencies. Stock agencies are companies that you give them permission to license your work to other entities. They make it available to people. Company X wants a picture of the Empire State Building, although that's trademarked, so it gets tricky. Let's say the George Washington Bridge, and they go to this site. Search for George Washington Bridge. Your picture is the best one. They love it. They download it and they pay money. Um, stock agencies in general, it's a lot harder to make money because so many people are doing it and some of it's a race to the bottom. There are stock agencies that do something called microstock where a picture might sell for a dollar and then they pay you 20%. So I don't think that's worth it personally. There is an agency out of the UK called Alamy, A-L-A-M-Y. And Alamy, anyone can sign a contract with them and they don't reject pictures except for technical things, like if it's out of focus or it's dusty with, you know, sensor dust. Um, so if you have pictures, you can go to Alamy, you can sign up, you can upload the pictures, you can select rights managed and royalty free. Rights managed is theoretically more money and less use, but it might sell less frequently. 
and that's a way to get out there. Uh, there's also a bunch of websites. There's uh, Fine Art America. There's Saatchi Art. Um, there's others. I don't. I haven't done anything with these, so I don't know how good they are. I just know they exist. Where you can sign up and put your travel work up there and sell prints. So I think that's all good. Flickr is a way to just get it out there and get it seen, sort of like Instagram. If you do Flickr, make sure that when you sign up and when you upload pictures, Flickr, I don't know if they still do, but they used to default to a Creative Commons license, which would allow people to download your picture and use it commercially without paying you. And I think without crediting you, you can unselect that. Make sure that you do, because um, I don't want someone making money off my pictures, especially without asking me. Like if you're gonna make money off my pictures, I should make money too. So just be careful with things like Flickr with that. Um, and then if you wanna publish a book, that's really, really difficult. Almost every photographer I know wants to publish a book and almost none of them have. Um, there's self-publishing. I've done books for, as like gifts for friends through Blurb and there's other things like that. Um, but if you wanna actually publish a book from a publisher, I mean, you can put together a pitch. It's going to have to be something really unique and different, or you have to be a huge name. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for joining us again. Really appreciate it. I want to thank Tony. I want to thank uh, Vitech Imaging Solutions for their time in sponsoring this event today. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. We look forward to seeing you again, and we can't wait to see what you bring us next. All right. It's a pleasure.